Good evening. This morning, Brother John did a great job talking and speaking on and helping us study on why worship and what that means and what that looks like. And I thought it was really, really good. And he really went in depth on us understanding why we worship and, and kind of what we worship. And as he was speaking and talking, I couldn't help but think of this quote that I'm pretty sure has been spoken from the pulpit before here that has been said several times. This is the quote. You cannot divide human beings into those who worship and those who don't. Everybody worships. It's just a matter of what or whom we serve. Very powerful quote. A quote that's very true to who we are and our core being. We worship something no matter what. Even if we say we worship God and God's not top priority, we still worship something. So I think it's just a, a really a good thought that I kind of want to kick us off with tonight. Do you know who you worship? Do you know who you serve? And who it is or who he is or what it is? I think sometimes, though, we want to define and say who God is in our own opinion, in our own way. And we don't really look at what the scriptures say to define who God is and what he is and who we serve. Throughout scripture, we see God defined for who he is. You know, we see Elijah on Mount Carmel trying to tell people and show people who God is. And they have these other people up here who are trying to find who their God is and who they worship and who they serve. And it's pretty interesting because Elijah pretty much just ends up mocking them. You know, he says, you know, cut your arms open, bleed, do whatever you have to. But I want you to watch what happens when I pray to my God. And I want you to see the truth of who my God is. But back to that thought of, I think a lot of times we want to say who God is in our own way. I think a good illustration is if somebody met me today and said, I met Ross Garrison today at church services. And they asked, well, what's he like? What's Ross like? And I said, well, he's a seven foot tall African-American. And another guy said, well, he's about a 5'10 Asian. And then another guy says, well, you guys are both right as long as you believe it in your heart. You know, none of that is true. What's true is, is I'm about a 5'9", very hairy, kind of short and kind of chubby guy. That's who I am. And all those other ones are not right. And I think, the, but that's how sometimes how we want to define God. We want to define God in our own opinion. Or, you know, we say, or some people say, as long as you believe this, or as long as you believe what your heart says, that's right and that's truth. Well, that's not right. That's not truth. What is right and what is truth is what the scriptures say. Exodus 3, 13 through 15 is it. You know, you want to know who God is. This is where it says it. A verse we've heard many times. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they asked me, what is his name? And what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abram, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. I am who I am. God is who he is. This is what this passage is saying. God is who he is. God absolutely is. This is the most basic fact and the most ultimate fact, period. Of the billions of facts that we see in this book, in the scriptures, this is the one that's at the top. It's the foundation of all others and the consumption of all others. Nothing is more basic, nothing is more ultimate than the fact that God is. And that's so important for our church. It's so important for where you're at in life. Nothing's more foundational in your life than this fact. For your marriage, for your job, for your health, for your mind, for your future, God is. Nothing is more foundational in the whole entire world. God is. But I think that a lot of times we tend to define our perception of anything on the progress of our life. Okay, what I mean by that is I am where I am and that's where I'm at. You know, our goals and our thoughts and where we're at in life defines pretty much everything. Whether if it we're finally at the point in our career where we want to be, or if we're, you know, in high school about to graduate and go to college, or if we're in college about to graduate and jump into the workforce, or, you know, whatever it may be, wherever you're at in the progress of your life is pretty much how you define yourself and how do you define what everything else is. And instead, it should be God is at that top. God is what defines me. And then we go down from that. 
Tonight, for just a couple minutes, I want to talk about how we define God, who God is, and what that looks like. And I want to use two different people in the scriptures. I want to look at Joseph, and I want to look at Ezekiel. I've been teaching the fifth grade class on Wednesday nights, and we have been working through this new Bible curriculum that is really, really good. It's great stuff. It's just great. If you haven't been able to look at it, I encourage you to check it out and look at it. And one of the stories we've been working through is Joseph. We just finished Joseph. And the story of Joseph and what he went through and how he did it is just so foundational and so important. It's really neat to be able to teach that and talk to fifth graders about that and see how that relates to them. But I want to refresh you a little bit just to kind of make sure we're on the same page. After being sold into slavery by his own brothers, Joseph surprisingly rose to power in perhaps the most powerful empire in the world. The Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw the Lord was with him, with Joseph, and the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. I want to stop right there. This is coming from Genesis chapter 39 if you're following along in your Bible. But I think it's really, really important statement here is that Joseph's master, in other words, Joseph's boss, saw that God was with him. That's a crazy thought. It's stated in the scriptures that Potiphar saw that God was with Joseph. So that's pretty much his boss, says master in this text, but boss. How many of our employees at work, how many of the people that we're associated with each and every day can say, hey, God is with them. Or hey, they follow Jesus. I can just see it. That's what was going on with Joseph. How many of that can be said for us? Whether you work at a bank, whether you work at school, whether you, you know, wherever you're at, whether you're a student, how many of us can say that the people around us, people that we associate with, know that we're a follower of Jesus? Joseph's boss could tell that he was a follower of God. Okay, back into Genesis 39. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. Potiphar put Joseph in charge of everything. But Potiphar's wife lusted after Joseph and tried to seduce him. When he faithfully refused her advances, she framed him, claiming he had come to her. Her lies ripped him from all his power, responsibility, and landed him in prison. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth, and yet he was treated as worse than a slave, locked away without hope of release. Joseph's resistance to temptation is a testimony to his trust in God. He knew who God was, and he knew that no matter what, if he trusted in God, things would work out. In that moment, it may not be that great, but he knew if he put that trust in God, it would eventually get him where he needed to be. You know, a few minutes ago, I talked about our progress. Where we're at in life defines who we are or who God is sometimes. But if you look at Joseph, he had a pretty good gig. He became, you know, the head guy in Potiphar's household, had a, you know, a great job. And then one thing, he didn't give in to the temptation. The next thing you know, everything kind of goes downhill. So if you looked at the progression of his life, you would think, man... And if that was how you define Joseph, he's lost everything, right? But if you look at it through a different perspective, maybe the right perspective, he didn't give in to that temptation. He didn't give in to that lust or whatever it may be. Instead, he put his trust in God and just got out. And he understood who God was and what God was going to do with him. Whether in power or in prison, Joseph's life was hope-filled, meaningful, and successful. Not because he worked so hard or received what he deserved, but because God was with him. The Lord was with him in success and the Lord was with him in prison. Or maybe, you know, to us that would be probably failure. But the Lord was with him. And the same goes for us. No matter where we are in life, God is with us. You know, if you look at today's world, if you look at everything that's going on the past little bit, there's been a lot of crazy stuff going on. I was talking this morning to our teens about the shooting in Opry Mills. I mean, that's just crazy. That's horrible. You know, but no matter what, If we're putting God and defining God for who he really is in our life and putting that trust in him, no matter what comes our way, God's going to be with us. So for the next few minutes, I want us to talk more about who God is. Before we do that, I want to tell you an illustration. It's an illustration I think goes along with this. It's an illustration you've heard before. I know that my favorite preacher of all time has told this illustration many a times, and that's John Nichols. So you've you've heard this before, but I think it goes really well with what we're talking about. It's a true story, I think, or at least that's what I've heard. There's this young man sitting next to an older woman on an airplane. Airplane flight, and they were experiencing some turbulence. And the little boy was sitting there on his iPad and very content. 
uh, and the old lady was getting scared, you know, buckled up, and, you know, there was a little bit of turbulence, and she was kind of uneasy, but the little boy was fine on his iPad, you know, nothing phased him, just kept playing his game. Hit some more turbulence, the plane kind of dropped, and, you know, the lady kind of screamed a little bit, but didn't affect the little boy. Still playing games on his iPad, perfectly fine. And the lady just kind of looked at him and was like, you know, thinking in her mind, what's going on with this little boy? How come he's not scared? You know, the lady's thinking to herself, I'm over here scared to death, and this little boy's fine just on his iPad. So it goes a little further on their flight, hits some more turbulence, plane drops a little bit, and she's even more paranoid, scared. The little boy's perfectly fine, perfectly content, perfectly calm, playing on his iPad. And finally, the lady looks at the little boy and says, are you not scared? What's going on? Like, do you not see what's happening? You know, we're hitting this turbulence. You know, what's going on? Why are you not scared? And the boy looked at the lady and said, Miss, really, I'm not scared at all because my daddy is the pilot of this plane. And it's going to be just fine. And in this story, in this, I guess it was newspaper or, or whatever, there's an editorial remark under the story that said, when your daddy is the pilot, the turbulence doesn't bother you as much because you trust the ability for him to handle the plane. In our lives, are we trusting God to handle everything? Do we understand who the pilot is? Do we understand who God is and what he's doing? And do we trust in him to handle our plane flight? Joseph did. Joseph was able to do that. Joseph went through so much and so many horrible things in the progression of his life. There was ups and there was downs and valleys and mountain peaks. But yet he trusted God. This afternoon, as I was kind of doing the final preparations, uh, getting this stuff together, I thought it would be a good idea to ask the teens who they thought God is, their definition of who God is. And I thought it was really neat, some of the answers that I got. And I wanted to share those with you tonight because I think it not only reflects what our teens are thinking, but also reflects this church and what we're teaching and just the, the goodness of that. And I think it helped me understand God better. And so I just sent the text out, said, who is God in a couple of words? This is what I got. God is many things, but I think primarily that God is important. He is everything. That was one Another one is God is love. God is creator. He saved us. God is good. God is greater, unchanging. He loves us. God is truth, steadfast, infinitely amazing, unshakable. God is awesome. God is alive. He is, comforts us, one above all. Beyond worldly thinking, incomprehensible, God is forgiving. It's pretty powerful to know that our young people know God that much. I don't even know if I would have been able to put some of those answers together and text that that's who our young people think god is and all those descriptions i feel like make me think of the things that joseph went through yet he still put his trust in god and he knew who god was do you know who god is do you know the things he's doing in your life i want to look at ezekiel for just a few minutes lots of people have strong opinions about who god is but if you look at ezekiel it helps us as well ezekiel 1 1 through 28 to understand this a little bit more. A lot of things happened during Ezekiel's time that are going on in the world right now. The world had failed to understand God during his time. Even God's own imprisoned people had forgotten him. The temple of Jerusalem was destroyed during Ezekiel's ministry, yet he still preached a message of judgment and of hope. This world, I feel like right now, not understanding God the way it needs to be, that way it should be. And it was going on in Ezekiel's time too. Another thing, good people were hurting then and good people were hurting now. Even Ezekiel himself suffered because of the sin of God's people in Ezekiel chapter 24. Another thing, God was still at work. If you look, you'll see that God was still doing things. When times are tough, God is still present, even if we think he's not. Even if we're in this progression of life and we feel the absence of God, he's still working. Even in times of exile or difficult times, God is present. I remember something my grandfather said before he passed away. He was talking about Christianity and just kind of talking to me a little bit. He said, Ross, Christianity is messy. Being a follower of Jesus sometimes can be messy. It isn't always neat and tidy. Life can be tough. There comes times when we hit rock bottom and we relate with the psalmist in Psalms 42 when he says, God, my rock, I cry out, why have you forgotten me? Why must I wander around in grief, oppressed by my enemies? Their taunts break my bones. They scoff. Where is this God of yours? I think we can relate to that sometimes. Everybody in scriptures we see have, sometimes goes through suffering. But God doesn't stop moving. His presence doesn't leave us. And we can't forget that. Uh, so when we think about who God is, you have to remember that his presence is there. Even during the tough times. Even during the hurting times. 
So Ezekiel chapter 1. The first thing I want us to realize is that God is greater than I am. Ezekiel 1 says, In my thirteenth year, in the fourth month of the fifth day, while I was among the exiles by the Kimbar River, the heavens were open, and I saw visions of God. On the fifth of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jochachim, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzz, by the Kabar River in the land of the Babylonians. And there the hand of the Lord was on him. I looked and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like glowing metal. And the fire was what looked like four living creatures in appearance, their form was human. So Ezekiel chapter 1. It kind of tells us, gives us a kind of a description of God and what he looks like. And for some reason, humanity has always wanted to be like God or be higher, be better than God. It goes back to Adam and Eve. Satan tempted Eve in the garden. In Genesis 3, Satan's trying to convince Eve, you will come like God. And we know the rest of the story and what happens. But I appreciate verse 4 of this passage at Ezekiel 1 because it tells how unique God is. God is not described as a kind old man or a friend, a neighbor, or even brother or sister, but rather unique and holy. An author, Louis Giglio, said this concerning this passage. God is holy, completely pure, and good. Humanity is not. As an expression of God's holiness, God disciplines his disobedient children. Reading the book of Ezekiel should lead people who are far from God to see his glory, hear of his grace, and draw near in repentance. This book should lead followers of Jesus to remember that perfect character of God, how he has already accomplished his gracious salvation. This book looks forward to and to the depend on the spirit of God to help them live for God in every area of life. Pretty cool description of Ezekiel and what this passage means and what it looks like. A lot of times we forget how great God is and this passage does a great job of describing how great God is. God is all-powerful and wise. God is all-powerful and wise. One of the hardest parts of this chapter is trying to understand and wrap our mind around these creatures in verses 5 through 24. I'm not going to read all that, but it's really hard to kind of understand what's going on here and the way it's described. But there are principles we can take from this text, okay? In verses 10 through 18, his perspective. God sees everything happening everywhere all the time. God sees it all. God knows what you're going through. God knows everything. He knows what's happening. His perspective on everything is what matters. Another thing we see is presence. We've already talked about this a little bit. His presence is important. God can go anywhere he chooses. In verses 17 through 21, we see that. And then another point is his power. God can do whatever he chooses to do. In verses 24 through 28, God is never limited by ignorance or inability Nothing can hold him back. He can handle our problems. He can take care of us. Sometimes we don't think that. Sometimes we don't want to think that. Sometimes we don't want to try to let him even take on our problems. But he can. God is not limited by my circumstances. For some reason, we think we get in these horrible circumstances. We make these bad choices. We get to these positions. And God is not going to be there. As those who were away from the land of promise, God's people needed to be reminded that they had not lost God with their land. God moves. He is as quick as lightning, Ezekiel 1, 13 through 14. There's the language in this passage uses the language, it says chariot. And what is all this kind of language supposed to mean as it uses chariot and as it talks about lightning and stuff like that? It means that God will not fit in my box. He's not limited to where I think he is. He can do anything. Psalms 139 verses 7 through 10 talks a lot about that. We sometimes believe that we can Go beyond his limits, but that's not true. He is always there. And God has come to us. He initiates. A lot of people don't believe that. A lot of people don't believe that God initiates things and tries to get things going. God made the effort to speak to his people through Ezekiel. Did God's people deserve that? Probably not. Do we deserve for him to initiate things in our life? Probably not, but he still does. How should God's people respond to his willingness to initiate contact with stubborn, sinful people? We should worship. We should praise and glorify. That's what John talked about this morning. God has spoken. The vision of God in Ezekiel 1 climaxes with a voice in verse 25. We see a progression in the vision from a sight to a sound to a voice. God hasn't just made his presence known. He's communicated perfectly 
through his scripture, through his word, that he wants us, that he cares about us, and he'll do anything for us, obviously. God's word is essential. His word gives life. So important. So after reading Ezekiel 1, after looking at that passage, what can we say when someone asks who God is or who is it that we serve or why do you follow Jesus in a world that's forsaken God, in a world of people that are hurting, in a world of people that need help, we should take comfort in the fact that God is still at work. He's greater than we are. He is all-powerful and wise. He is not limited by my circumstances or by any circumstances. He has initiated contact with us, and He has spoken. All those things He did in Ezekiel, He still does today. That's what's so important. That's what sometimes we forget. Our problem isn't knowing who God is. It's recognizing Him for who He is and what He's capable of doing and letting Him do those things in our lives. That's what we don't do sometimes. Like I said, I talked last week on Psalm 51. We talked about David. And we talked about sometimes the main thing that blocks us from God being active in our life is our own self. Because we haven't put God at the top. And so in this passage in Ezekiel chapter 1, it is very relatable because a lot of the things that are happening are going on today. And when you want to try to define who God is, you can look at Scripture for that. You know, we looked at Exodus. We looked several different things but tonight the main thing that i want you to know is that god is who he is exodus chapter three so those are just a few thoughts on defining god and who he is and what he's doing uh, let's have a prayer together and then we'll offer an invitation father god we're so grateful for your love that you rang down upon us we're grateful for this congregation and ask that you continue to bless us bless the work that's going on i'm grateful for all those that do so much for this congregation to glorify you, to give you glory, to worship you. Please help us to strive to know you, to show you, and to care for others through you. We're so grateful for our brother Jesus, our Savior Jesus, our friend Jesus. And help us to strive to be in a discipleship with him and follow in our rabbi's dust and try to do the things that he did, show the kindness that he showed. We're so grateful for Jesus, and it's in his name we live and we pray. Amen. Uh, as we always do, we want to offer an invitation for those that may need it. I don't know where you're at tonight, but if you feel like you don't know God for who he is and don't have that relationship with him that you should, we want to help you tonight. We want to pray with you. We want to put our arms around you and help. If you're not a Christian, there's no better time than right now than to put Jesus on in baptism, to wash away your sins, and to give your life to our God. If we can help you in any way, please come right now as we stand and as we sing.